Should you file that appeal, please make sure and ask for our evidence packet. That does a couple of things for you. If you'll write on your protest form that you want to receive a copy of your evidence packet, it will require me to get that to you. And it also literally hand ties me to that data. So if I get more information about your value, I cannot introduce it once I've given you that evidence packet. So it's 100% in your favor. It's 100% for free. And unfortunately, some years ago, I'd say three or four sessions ago, I could have given you all the sales information you wanted just any day of the week over the phone if you had just called me. Nowadays, the state legislature has seen fit to enact legislation that requires you to have a protest on file before I can give you sales information. Anyway, once you get that information, you're, you need to know there's two ways you can appeal, both from an equity appeal or from a market appeal. An equity appeal just looks at your property in relation to similarly situated properties within your own neighborhood. Sometimes within your own subdivision, sometimes it's a confluence of subdivisions that make up a neighborhood. But it'll show you how your property is appraised in relation to all your other neighbors. And if it's out of kilter with similar, similarly situated, similarly appointed homes, then that certainly is a grounds for appeal. If the sales that we have don't support the value that we've placed on your property. A lot of neighborhoods I've been to have seen increases in their land value. A lot of land values in neighborhoods haven't been adjusted since 06 or 08. That's no fault of yours, that's just our fault. The law requires us, I've been in this business since the property tax system was enacted in 1980, and it's always been this way. The legislature requires a separate land and improvement value. That improvement doesn't mean you made improvements to your property. It simply means the improvement or the building or the structure that sits on your lot. That's all that means. When you buy a home, generally you get a price, 150, 200,000, whatever the number is. They don't say 25,000 for the lot, 125,000 for the improvements. It's just a package deal. The package deal is here, our value, the land value and the improvement <coughs> value summed up together must equal market value. If it doesn't, that's a valid grounds for appeal. In addition to getting our evidence packet, I'd like to suggest a couple of websites that are free. Redfin.com, a really, really, really helpful website in San Antonio. It's actually a national website. It's a huge database. But it goes down to the zip code, to the street level, to the neighborhood. Can you say um, that? I'm sorry? Can you say the name of the website? Yes, it's Redfin. R-E-D-F-I-N dot com. You've probably heard of this one also, which is Zillow. Yeah. You might even get mailers in the mail from them telling, them telling you what they think your home is worth based on data in your zip code. Uh, sometimes that happens. It happens to me. Anyway, does that information together with perhaps a competitive market analysis from your realtor, or if you have a realtor in your neighborhood that's active, that can be helpful? If you're particularly aware of a number of homes that have been listed for sale and simply aren't selling, that's helpful information too, folks. That doesn't happen very often anymore because we currently have just over a three-month supply of housing stock in San Antonio in general. A market is considered to be in balance when you have a six-month supply. It typically takes 90, maybe 100 days to sell a property. Most of the time, when I see homes go up for sale in my neighborhood, they might be there a day, they might be there a week, but they're not there three months, that's for sure. Normally, there's full price offers. We oftentimes <coughs> see over list price offers, and we oftentimes see multiple offers on the same property should one fail. So the market is definitely in the favor of sellers and not buyers at this time. And unfortunately, because the property tax is so aggressive in nature, if you're neither a buyer nor a seller, you just want to live in your house, it's really not that good for you either. A couple things you want to make, and the reason I say that is, is as values go up, generally speaking, your taxes go up. Even if the city lowers their tax rate, even if the county lowers their tax rate, 
It tends not to come down commensurately with the increases in value, which is kind of what SB2 was all about. Now I'm going to put on my other hat for just a minute, if you'll just bear with me. Um, in 2014, the State Controller's Office came into my office and they downloaded all of my data, all of my appraisal data, and all of my sales data. The state controller is the chief revenue collector and estimator for the state legislature. As a matter of law, they're required to study every appraisal district every other year to make sure that the values are in uniformity and in conformity. And all that means statistically is, is that they're not less than 95% of market value nor over 105%. That's a plus or minus 10% differential. I try to look as poor as I can within tolerance in every school district, thereby, for my poor school districts, assuring they get the maximum amount of state aid, and in my wealthier school, school districts, to make sure they pay the least amount of recapture to Austin to redistribute. San Antonio is both a victim and a benefactor of that redistribution process. It actually was born here in Edgewood about 35 years ago. So, Unfortunately, I've been in this business that long. I know that. When the controller came into my office in 2014, the market had substantially rebounded in San Antonio, and we had not. And I got caught with 10 out of 12 school districts falling out of tolerance. Not one of them overassessed. Every single one of them was underappraised, according to the state's estimators. I then had to do what I'm asking you to do, and I had to file an appeal on behalf of those 10 school districts. It took me about seven months. Everything had to be produced in triplicate. The state still requires everything in paper. They require me to give them everything electronically. And I went through a tribunal, not unlike an arbitration. Um, we were successful in every one of them, but what that told me is, not, not like I didn't know, but the state, while it's prohibited from having a property tax, it controls all the purse strings to the biggest part of your property tax. When those senators came to town and wanted to talk to the citizens of Bear County and the other 11 counties they went to throughout the state, they were beating on the city, they were beating on the county about their percentage of the total tax bill. If you go home and look at your total estimate of taxes, or if you look at your last year's taxes, you'll see that the state because the state is responsible for free public schools, is responsible for over half, approximately 55 to 56 percent of your total tax bill. So they were worrying about the 16 percent that the city and county might be adding to it, instead of dealing with something that they actually had some control over, which is how much they find <coughs> public education to. Here's something else I learned in the process of filing those appeals. And I was somewhat aware of this, but I am uniquely and absolutely aware of this now. Every time a major metropolitan appraisal district in the state of Texas, including Dallas, Austin, Houston, San Antonio, I think El Paso is even included, uh, obviously Fort Worth is as well, every time those six or eight major appraisal districts raise values, as we're forced to by the controller, by the market, Every time we raise values, the state's contribution rate goes down. That's according to the state's public finance education system. The LBB has warned the legislature for two sessions in a row, and they've chose to markedly ignore it. If you go to Windows on state government, you can see on Glenn Hager's website, the LBB has published 10 years worth of actual tax collected for school districts. Who paid and who didn't? 10 years ago, citizens paid about 40% of public education costs through your local tax collection efforts. The state paid 60%. Before this year's reappraisal, the state was paying 50, I'm sorry, citizens were paying 55% the state share had dropped down to 45%. Those are big numbers, folks. That's a number that most of you can't recover from. In 10 years, we saw the state's contribution drop 15%. And that's 15% of $45 billion. 
not billion dollars in value, billion dollars in taxes. That's a real high level view of why things happen the way they do, and particularly in your neighborhoods. As I say, your best evidence is going to be to gather our evidence packet. Um, if you have not filed a protest and you wish to file a protest and get your evidence packet in hand, you can come to my office tomorrow or Wednesday. I think Thursday we actually start a scheduled hearing time. But if you already have a protest on file and you want to come in and try to deal with it in the next couple of days, you can walk in, as about 800 people have so far. Uh, it's uh, absolutely a, a not confrontational process. I have about 32 appraisers waiting to assist you. Uh, I've never seen more than two people in line at any given time, even during the lunch hour. We don't allow everyone to leave the building at the same time. Uh, so I would invite you to take advantage of that if you're so inclined. Um, why is this important? I've talked to you about some of the efforts on the state's part and some of the lack of effort on the state's part. <clears throat> Most of what's going to pass this session is going to benefit the wealthiest taxpayers in the state of Texas. Commercial and the attorneys that represent them. That's the only thing that's going to pass. There's no property tax relief coming. The property tax relief is at hand for the state if they choose to deal with public school finance. They have not. I'll say, I've said this before, uh, I don't really care what party you belong to. If not for Joe Strauss, it could have been a whole lot worse. If not for the Speaker of the House, a whole lot worse things could be happening to San Antonio. Um, I will tell you this, we don't even have a good relationship, <laughs> but I, I feel that strongly about what he's done, and I've watched it all year long, as I have for the last 20 years, I've uh, been involved in the legislative process. Trends going forward, the Real Estate Center of Texas A&M, the San Antonio Board of Realtors, the Texas Association of Realtors, the National Association of Realtors, shows virtually every major metropolitan area in Texas, continuing along this trend through 2020. That's not sustainable. We don't have enough housing stock. We don't have enough lots coming out of the ground. We have people moving here with jobs, for jobs, and obviously driving up these values. Um, I don't know what the answer is, except to arm yourself as best you can to control your own situation at home. I was speaking to the councilman some years ago. I had entertained a, a local representative uh, who will go unnamed, uh, but I had engaged him in a discussion about trying to create a circuit breaker because there are substantial benefits for senior citizens. There are super substantial benefits for veterans and, and disabled veterans. But if you're an average Joe who inherited a home from your parents, or you happened to buy a home 10 years ago, maybe you lost your job during the recession, and you're just now getting back on your feet, there's nothing there for you. There's absolutely nothing to help you. In most states, they have a state income tax. I'm neither an advocate, that's not true. I am an advocate for an income tax. It's a lot fairer than what we have. But the truth of the matter is, it's a lot easier to apply a circuit breaker or a way to measure somebody's ability to pay where the property tax doesn't care about your ability to pay. It simply says you own a property that's worth X and based on market value and ad valorem, which is uh, Latin for meaning according to value, this is a tax you owe. Sounds a whole lot like Caesar. But that's the system we have. It's very regressive. I commend you all for being here uh, I want to answer as many questions as I can. I know they've set up a front mic here. If you're embarrassed and you want me to come out to say so, I'll do that. Uh, but if there are questions, I'm happy to start that now. Yes, sir, thank you. Sure, I'll, I'll start. Um, would you mind just explaining uh, how we might appeal a land value in a neighborhood? So, for instance, in, I live in Lavaca, and all the land values have gone up. Mine was 28,000 last year, and now it's 130,000 from 2016 to 2017. So I'm not sure how we would appeal that 
and I have friends who are realtors, but if everything's kind of uniformly looking for a comp in a neighborhood, something that would be equitable, it just that doesn't seem possible. Excellent question. As I said, um, since the inception of the property tax, the legislature has always required us somewhat arbitrarily to simply separate the land from the improvement value. I don't know why, it's just always been that way. You are not authorized to file an appeal just on land unless you just have a vacant lot. If you have a lot with an improvement on it, whether it's commercial, residential, multifamily, some sort of structure, I'm going to speak to your home. I'm assuming there's a home on your lot. You need to look at that cumulative value. You need to get our cumulative data on cumulative value sales in your neighborhood. You need to contact those websites I told you about. If you're in Lavaca, I guarantee you there's a handful of realtors that are very active in that area. They all want your business, they all want to list your house, and they'll all give you that information, typically for free. Um, you know, you have to attack what you have in front of you, and what you have in front of you is a house and land value. The sum total, the total value must equal market value. Do you have your homestead exemption? Did you have it last year? So, even though your total value went up a lot, you're still capped at 10% over last year's value. That's a tremendous benefit for a homesteaded property. Um, that homestead, if you have a, if you have your homestead, great. If you did have a homestead and you were eligible last year, we can go back one year and reinstate your homestead, your over 65, your disabled veterans, just about any exemption you would have otherwise been eligible for, I can go back one year according to state law. Good question. Not a good answer, sorry. Yes, sir. Good evening. Thank you for uh, your presentation. Um, I have a, a smaller home house in one of the visits to two bedrooms. My taxes are going to go up uh, about 10,000. Obviously, there's a little shock about that. And I'm going to protest it. In fact, I found out I've got the most expensive home in one of the visits. But my question is uh, when I protest it, I wanted to find out more information when I go down to uh, do the protest. I want to find out from the evidence package what that information is and how to interpret it. And I was given a kind of a rush of saying, oh, you have to come to the protest and they'll tell you then. But that's kind of defeating the object. I need to know before I go to do my protest. By all accounts, I only have like five minutes to do my presentation. It's not going to work. Help me out find out to explain the evidence when, package, please. When did you come to my office? I came down last week. Okay. Number one, thank you for that question, sir. I'm very sorry for the response you got. If you get the brushed off feeling from anyone on my staff, please get their name. Everyone has a business card. I don't care where they work in my building. My janitor has a business card. If you are mistreated by anyone in my office, please get their name so that I can find out who it is so we can address the situation. As to your question, um, if you will call me tomorrow morning, I will have my secretary print out your evidence back. And I assume you dropped off your protest? Yes, I do have the evidence back, but I need to, somebody to tell me what it all means, how the numbers work. I see, I see. In the evidence packet, you recall I said there was an equity section. You said you know you're the highest price per square foot in Monta Vista. You have one of the smallest homes in Monta Vista. The smaller the home, just on an economy of scale, everything being equal. If you have a 1,000 square foot home, a 2,000 square foot, and a 3,000 square foot home, the smallest home is always going to have the highest price per square foot. It's not going to be the highest price property, but it will be the highest price per square foot. If the lot values are the same and you have to distribute that over the same amount of square footage, that's going to have a, a very adverse impact on how the value looks. Most importantly, um, I suspect in Monte Vista there are going to be the sales that we have of homes that are of similar size and quality of construction. Your construction is your home. Has your home been updated? Very, very important. If you live in an older neighborhood where there is a ton of remodeling going on, in fact, we have a lot of neighborhoods where they're frankly buying homes for a quarter of a million dollars, tearing them down and putting up an $800,000 house. It's very important that you go ahead and document the interior of your home, not that it isn't nice, 
but my home is very nice, but it's 22 years old. My wife assures me we're going to have a new kitchen before it's 23 years old. And I assume that as long as I'm going to have those guys doing that, we're going to do the bathroom as well. Um, that's the best I can offer you. If you have an older home and it's not been updated, it's not been modernized, it doesn't have all the stainless steel, marble, you know, whatever kind of tile people are putting in your particular neighborhood, make sure and document that. It'll be very apparent to us. And if you're still not satisfied, when you come to your informal, please ask for uh, an inspection and we'll send an appraiser out to your property, usually two, um, both for your safety and theirs. Um, lastly, if, if you find poor or shoddy treatment, I'm almost never gone from the office during this time of the year. I haven't had a summertime vacation in about 25 years. <coughs> but I assure you I won't be going anywhere this summer. Um, if you have bad treatment, please come down the hall. I'm at the farthest end, my door is always open. I'm the opposite end of the residential department, the extreme opposite end. I, get, I think that's the north end of the building. Every department has a manager. Residential has four supervisors and an assistant manager and a department manager. There's no reason you can't see someone. Yes, ma'am. Back to the land values. I did my research. I'm in Lobotta, too. Two blocks away, the land values only doubled. Ours went up between 400 and 500 percent. That's not fair. My other question is, and, and I'd like to know if there's anything we can do about that. Maybe a class action lawsuit. Maybe the city can file a lawsuit against the state. Band together with Dallas and Houston and Austin and do the same. Because I know people in Austin are also just gasping. Is there any way to get an evidence package without having to go to the office? Because I work from 7.30 in the morning until 6 at night and all are closed. Sure. So if you can address those three things, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. As I stated initially, when you file your protest, if you'll simply annotate on your protest that you wish to receive the evidence packet, It'll be prepared and mailed to you uh, in advance of your hearing. As to the land value two blocks away, I don't know if it's part of Lavaca or not, but I know that as you move further south, the values drop rather abruptly. Why? Because that's what the market seems to indicate. Again, it's not just the land value, but the cumulative value for those markets. Just as you leave King William and you enter into Lavaca and you go further south into Lone Star and other developing neighborhoods, they have substantially lower values as you go further south, if you will. Um, that may change over time as we see a lot of property being redeveloped in the Lone Star District. Uh, but each of these districts carries its own burden of what sales are transpiring. Uh, that, that, that's the primary reason. The, the expectation is, though, is that Lone Star, I've been hearing about Lone Star being developed You know, you may have a valid argument there. I can tell you that simply having double the amount of square footage doesn't necessarily double the value of the land. Again. Well, it obviously does because he has the same size lot I do. And between the two of them, that's, you know, 340000 or $250,000. Is the total value relative to what the property ought to be worth? Or is it not? I'm saying, from a market standpoint, are the properties worth what they're appraised at, the total value of the land? I don't think so, no, because, uh, as I said, the end, there's an anticipation, an expectation of more development, more development in our neighborhood. 
Yes, ma'am. Okay. There are three laws that have been cleared for them to go condos. Right. Okay. Two of them have been empty for three years. Right. So it, unless the builders have the developers have already built that stuff, I don't think it's fair to raise our prices in expectation of them making money. Well, I also don't think that it's appropriate that we would use a value of land sales to be developed into multi-family or condominium property to appraise a residential lot either. And so, you know, you have a, a I wouldn't say a unique situation because it happens a lot in around the urban core, quite honestly, all around the center of San Antonio. Uh, but each of those areas has their own specialists and their own folks that are more familiar with each neighborhood. I simply suggest you gather the data, not only ours, but yours, and come in and have a conversation with them. As to whether or not you can do a class action suit, I've learned over time, the older I get, anybody can sue you for anything or nothing at all. And so that's up to y'all. Uh, I don't really know what exactly it would entail. I know that you won't have jurisdiction to sue me just on your land. I, I, I'm the guy. I'm, I'm the one you have to sue. It doesn't hurt my feelings. My best friends sue. And some of my worst enemies sue. It's just part of my job. It's, you know, it's like being a gastro doctor. You don't get to pick who you get to work on that day. It is what it is. The truth of the matter is, I asked Bear County to sue me uh, in open court about four years ago because all the appeals I have from commercial property owners totals for last year $23 billion <coughs> in taxable value. Equal and Uniform Appeals was designed for exactly the problem you're talking about. For you to be able to compare your home to other homes similarly situated in your neighborhood and find out what the disparaging differences are and make adjustments for that. What's being done in Texas today and it's unprecedented in the nation, this doesn't exist in another state, is you take the very best hotel in San Antonio. Anybody know who that might be? That would be the JW Marriott. You take the very best hotel and you compare it to 10 other hotels and you find the median. Everybody knows what the median is, right? Here's the high, here's the low, here's the median, one right in the middle. The JW Marriott unarguably should be at the top. But under this statute, it's moved to the middle because it cannot be assessed, no property can be assessed in excess of its median level of value compared to similar properties appropriately adjusted. They've taken this law that was intended to protect homeowners and they apply it to the best commercial property. Now, the six or eight properties that used to be appraised below the JW Marriott are now appraised above the JW Marriott and they come in and spin off of that too. And so the spiral goes down, and down, and down, except for homeowners. Because you typically, your situation sounds rather unique, but typically homeowners are not as successful at getting that larger reduction <coughs> simply because there aren't that big of discrepancies in value. There's nothing to compare the JW Marriott to in San Antonio. There may be one other hotel, but they lost their signature golf course or golf tournament to the JW Marriott. I don't know how you make up for that. I know that the JW Marriott, second only to the AT&T Center, is always number one in liquor sales and sales tax collection. Nobody in second place. We haven't even talked about their hotel rooms yet. That's just from all the catering and dining and whining and partying that goes on and golf. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Yes. Sir. So, talking about equity and treatment, can you talk a little bit about how a dispute might be handled if we chose to go with a consulting firm and pay for their services versus me, myself, going up and, and purchasing? Sure. If I may, on a personal level, I'm always going to treat a homeowner better than I will a tax agent, bottom line. Most of them are attorneys or work for an attorney firm. Um, some of them are good guys. A bunch of them I fired right out of my office. Um, 
I don't handle taxpayer appeals. I, I don't really know how my staff feel about it. I know that I don't like my appraisers being too friendly with tax agents. If they go to lunch with a tax agent, I'll fire them. We routinely follow changes that are made by tax agents with my staff. Anything above 10% or a certain dollar amount must be reviewed by a manager. I want to make sure that I don't end up on the front page of the San Antonio Express News by accident. <coughs> on the other hand, some of these guys are very effective. They know how to game the system. The bill that is going to pass in the Texas Senate, Senate Bill 669 by Senator Nelson, contains everything a tax agent could possibly want. So if you have a tax consultant, the game just got better for you. If you don't have a tax consultant, maybe not so much. That's not an endorsement of using a tax consultant. That's just the facts, folks. Uh, I'm not a legislator, but I watch every single tax bill that's been filed. I've watched virtually all of them. Some of them were good bills go down in flames. And the only thing that passed was going to benefit commercial and tax agent represented property. Now, most tax agents will offer to do the work for free unless they save you something. And then they're going to want to split whatever the tax savings is. If you have a relatively modest home, like most folks in San Antonio, it doesn't make a lot of sense because that's the property type that we have the most information on. That's what mostly sells in San Antonio. At the same time, if you have a more exclusive neighborhood and a more high-priced home, you'll find a disproportionate number of those folks are represented by tax agents. There is a standing open records request for every change gets processed by the review board every day by virtually every tax agent firm. So they're tracking every single value that gets reduced everywhere in San Antonio every day. So that they have the latest, greatest information for whenever the next case comes up. That may or may not be your case. I don't know. But I know that's a very common practice. And as a matter of law, I have to respond to it and give them the data. I don't know if that helps. I think there was a lady in the back. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you very much for being here. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for District 1 hosting this. So I'm the lady who protests every year, just because I think it's the right thing to do. I want to know if my evidence packet of my comps changes. I've reviewed, like, say, the last three years, and it seems like all 100 homes stay the same. Can I pretty much be assured that that's going to happen again? That's my first question. You know, um, from an equity standpoint, I can see how that's plausible because they're going to, the neighborhood boundaries don't change that much. No, sir. If you do have something that happens uh, where there's a new roadway, a new highway that separates the properties, that could change a neighborhood. Uh, school district boundary shifting can sometimes change the complex nature of a neighborhood. Other than that, it should stay relatively the same. From a market standpoint, that data should change because I would expect not the same 100 homes or 10 homes in the neighborhood to stay. <coughs> so from, a, from an equity standpoint, yes, I would think that would be very plausible if that would stay the same. My second question is, all of a sudden we have an extreme amount of vacant homes that are now being boarded up in my neighborhood. Does that play a role in my overall protest? Well, you know, it, it will. And photos are worth a thousand words. Um, I would suggest that you take pictures of those homes. Um, I don't know how long these homes have been boarded up or how long that's been going on, but I'm really surprised because we have four investment groups that have bought up over 4,000 homes in Bear County in every zip code you can possibly imagine. Uh, from 09 to the Dominion, to the east side, to the south side, and various parts of the northeast side. And they're basically bottom feeders looking for, when I say that, they're looking for distressed property, whether they're institutionally owned, if they're taxes owed, if they're whatever reason. Uh, a lot of people were unemployed several years ago, and a lot of people found themselves in a bad way and unloaded property. These guys buy the property rock bottom for cash, as low as they can get it, and they intend to operate it and create a 7 to 10% return over the next 7 to 10 years. And uh, 
I know one group has about six hundred million dollars of cones throughout Bear County. And this is a very common practice throughout Bear County, Dallas, Houston, everywhere. Uh, but certainly I would expect that those boarded up homes would have a negative impact on the sales that have occurred, and we would certainly want to look at that in relation to what the values have been for however long this has been going on. We typically maintain, the state only allows us to use sales from about June to June, and the target date being January 1. That's always your argument date, January 1. In this market, that's a good thing for you because since January 1, the market's still doing this. And so you want to make sure and keep your argument as a relative around the last quarter of the last year to the first quarter of this year probably going to yield the best result for you. Another question. You mentioned the power of the homestead exemption for ordinary people. Oh, sure. And Councilman Trevino also talked about stability in neighborhoods. One of the things that we're seeing in King William and Lalaka is the turnover of single family residences into short term rentals. I do not mean owner occupied grandma's trying to pay her tax bill by renting out a room. I'm talking about companies coming in and running businesses out of those homes. Yes. A number of those still have full homestead assumptions on them. What can your office do to help us? That's not fair. When the business claims a full homestead exemption on a business property, it places an undue burden on the rest of us. I 100% agree with you, and we can do virtually nothing about it as long as still the principal homestead. The statutes have not been addressed to allow us to require them to reapply? Except when it's obvious from your own role that a business is owning the property, not a beneficial trust, a business, an LLC, a corporation, mm -hmm. that should not be entitled to full property tax exemption. If in fact the property has been transferred to a business entity, that would generally spark a reapplication request. Uh, certainly, and I'm not kidding folks, you can laugh if you want, a lot of people write me every year and tell me XYZ doesn't live at this neighborhood anymore, doesn't live at this address. We recently had a council member that, or a candidate that was running for office, actually a couple of them around the city, that didn't even have residency in the district that they were claiming to be wanting to represent. We oftentimes get inquiries about that. Um, any information you want to share with us, we're happy to look at. Uh, I can tell you that if you are a CPA and you have a residence homestead in King William or in any other subdivision or neighborhood and you want to claim part of it as your office, that whatever percentage of your total square footage will be carved out and you will lose that part of your exemption. Air bed and breakfast is a relatively new thing to San Antonio. It's been going on for about 10 years, maybe a little longer in Austin. Uh, but as San Antonio grows more and more venue-oriented, uh, events-oriented, I think that's going to proliferate. Uh, and in the different parts of town, not just downtown, but it certainly is very pervasive. It's an excellent question. Something I'll certainly talk to my staff about. Uh, it's also something else that uh, I always talk to Robert, because uh, he's not only a council member, he's a voting member on my board about the kinds of things that we ought to be talking to our own delegation about. Um, if you follow Texas politics, if you're a Democrat in Austin, you're not going to do a whole lot. If you remember, Joe Strauss <coughs> is the Speaker of the House and from San Antonio, that's a very friendly year to have. Um, as I said, I don't have that great communication in with him. But I do know people in the community that do, and I oftentimes speak to them. That's a very good point that probably ought to be addressed. That was another question about class action suing the city or, or the state. And, you know, I'm all for that. I'm kind of an activist kind of guy. The venues are not really that great uh, because the state's not all that amenable to being sued. Uh, the guy that operates 
my homeowners association, which is Associa, uh, it's one of the largest ones in the nation, certainly in the southern United States, was Senator Corona. And when he retired and went back to work in Dallas, I talked to him about this equity appeal issue. Not one of those commercial property owners whose $23 billion they're seeking to remove about 15 or 20 percent off the tax roll is alleging that we've overassessed them. They're all saying they're unequally appraised. I asked him, would you consider suing me in a class action suit on behalf of my subdivision, another associate subdivision? There's literally hundreds of them in any community in Texas, any metro community. And we had an ongoing discussion, his general counsel and I, for about three months. And then all of a sudden, they dropped me like a hot potato. And so I can only assume that one of the big packs got a hold of him and said, if you ever plan to work in Texas again, you need to stop this. Business is very, very, very much liking the way property taxes work for them in Texas. Next question. Sure, I think I can hear you. Sometimes you can't hear when they're facing you up there. But I have a question. Okay, we have to march a maker first. Correct. To mail the protest. And we just write on here to you an evidence packet. That's correct. How do we know what to put for our reason until we get the evidence? You know, the evidence package will have comparable homes to ours. Let me just answer that question this way here, because you're either going to need to mail that in, or you can protest on a napkin. I don't care. I just need to be able to identify your property, the address, the property ID number, and your reason for appeal. For homeowners, I always say, check market, check equity. Those are the two main things you can appeal. Most of the other reasons don't apply, unless you're missing an exemption. And if you have any other concern, always check other, and then you're covered. Because why I asked about the evidence package, in our neighborhood, we had an instance where this house was bought, and they spent an enormous amount of money remodeling it, and it was on the market for $450,000, which is not comparable to anything Sure. In our whole area. Sure. And some dummy paid three hundred and ninety thousand. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you always give me that dummy? <laughs> so, you know, how is that equitable? My property is deteriorating. You know? If you'll recall, that's a that's a very good question, but if you'll recall, I kind of covered that already. <coughs> if you have properties that are selling for ginormous prices in your neighborhood and you know that there have been a ton of remodels and additions and improvements made to the properties and your property, while it may be very nice and comfortable for you, still has the original, you know, 30-year-old or 40-year-old plumbing fixtures, pictures are worth a thousand words. We can tell new tile and marble from 30-year-old ceramic. And we just need to bring those then to the informal? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Eighty percent of all appeals are handled by my staff. Yes, sir. Do you see any opportunity coming to us in the near term, or is there a process that we should do to try to get a little more equity on the way this whole thing goes? Obviously, the property holder is the one being held hostage by what some of these businesses, some of these attorneys are doing. Uh, obviously, in the neighborhood where we own this small piece of dirt that we have, yes, uh, the, the, it has just skyrocketed, and yet, there are no offers on that piece of dirt. Just because they're developing a different property on a, a neighboring block, why should I pay the consequences of higher taxes on something that hasn't changed anything in 40 years? I haven't discussed that property with you a little bit as you guys made your way in. I'm a little concerned. Uh, I don't know if it's being handled by a residential department or a commercial department. But in either case, we need to take a, a really good look at that and, and provide you the evidence that we have to support or change that value. Um, I, I'm a little concerned about it, to be honest with you. Uh, I know Elmira, I know there's lots of parts of Elmira that are very commercial, I know there's other parts that are not so much. Um, I know that there are homes 
that are notorious crack houses. Uh, I know there are homes that have more violations than I got follicles of hair. Uh, but, you know, all I can do is offer to work with you and have my staff work with you. And uh, I don't see anything in the near future short of working with our council. And, you know, Robert is a very forward-thinking guy. He's got an open mind to a lot of different things. He doesn't know a whole lot about property tax because by law he's not supposed to. He's supposed to hire and fire me, as my board of directors does, adopt policy and adopt a budget, and then stay out of my business. And that's largely what they do. If I am not attentive, they should fire me. If I'm not appraising property appropriately, they should fire me. If I'm failing to study, they should fire me. There's a lot more reasons they should fire me, but I've been doing this for 36 years. I'm not telling you I'm really good at it. I'm sure you don't think I am. And maybe she doesn't think I am. But that's okay. Uh, I would rather have a taxpayer sue me, even over a bad ARB decision, and I've had this happen in Bear County, where I've asked the property owner to just go ahead and file suit, and we'll settle it out of court. And I've done that. If you have need to go beyond the appraisal review board process, and keep in mind, um, the appraisal review board is appointed nowadays and has been for the last two or three sessions, so four or six years, by a local state district court judge. My board of directors, as a matter of law, formerly appointed them. Uh, now they only appoint the chair and the secretary. After this session, they don't even do that. Uh, so everything will be done by the judge. And uh, I suggest, you know, if you really feel strongly about it, that you ought to get yourself an application and fill it out. I can tell you most of those guys get paid somewhere between $135 and $160 a day. They have very long days of listening to hearings for about four months out of the year. Outside of that, they listen to taxpayer appeals on a monthly basis, usually one day a month. Uh, in December, when there's a changing of the guard, generally speaking, um, they sometimes have training sessions that might be a day, day and a half, uh, which you're compensated for if you're a member of the appraisal review board. Um, I don't even know who's on my board. It's against the law for me to have any communication with them outside of an open hearing. And so consequently, I don't know if they're taxpayers or if the guy's just wearing a tie because he thinks he's somebody. I don't, I don't know. Yes, sir. Jack? Say I own a property on a given block. How far away should a transaction take place from that location before it does not affect my property? It could be next door to you. It could be a mile away. A mile away. I, you know, I'm not sure. Every situation is going to be a little different. If you're out in the county, I know appraisers that go four miles away. I'm talking about fee appraisers because there's not a lot of sales out in the county. You have to go further. So depending on the amount of activity, the closer the, the closer to the subject property, the better we like it. The more reliable that data is going to be. The further away we get, the less reliable the data is. But there's no standard rule of thumb, nor is there a requirement of law. So it well. To take another number, uh, 20 miles away. That's pretty unrealistic. I don't know what could possibly be comparable 20 miles away, but it could happen. I mean, maybe in West Texas. Sure. Uh, I mean, there isn't any standard. There isn't any scientific uh, evaluation. That that There's absolutely nothing scientific about appraisal. It is an art that is not an opinion, that is the truth. Um, there are statistical measures that we can use. There are some common sense measures you can use in the selection and the adjustments of the comparables that are being used and selected. Sometimes we make mistakes, and uh, that may be shocking to you, but if I have 32 residential appraisers and 531,000 properties to appraise, it's entirely possible we could make a mistake somewhere. 
And if we do, it's better you to find it than your tax agent. We ought to be fixing that mistake for you right off the bat. It sounds like a very crazy, unrealistic process here, if, if that can happen. I'd have to agree with you, but that's what we've been living with for 36 years. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Tested twice. Once, the first time I went to the formal hearing, yes. straight to the formal hearing, and the second time I went to the informal. The first time um, I did a whole lot of work and I looked at all of my comps that I got in the mail and um, you know took out the properties that weren't within my particular neighborhood boundaries sure. because there were quite a few of those sure. that were being used. Uh, as comps for my property, so I did all and I did all this other work, and I went in to my my formal hearing, and, and they said, "Oh yeah, no, you're right, you're right." And I had either the three um, volunteers, I guess they are, okay. across the desk, and then the the uh, appraiser. Yes. And so I had a good result. I was very happy, um, but I have to say that. Um, the mood. It was very, it was like a little, it was a hostile environment, you know, and I'm very polite. And, um, and, and the person, she was talking fast and furious and, you know, and, and I can only imagine, I have done so much work on this. Sure. I spent quite a few hours compared to someone who's asking, you know, who, who has never done it before. It, 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 I, I just hope for them, I think, gosh, you know, listening to some of the questions, I'm, like, I'm hoping they have a decent experience, you know, and, I don't forget, and then in my informal hearing I went to, that got settled there, I wasn't as pleased with the uh, situation, but that was in a smaller room, there was a young lady who <coughs> listened to my appeal, and an older woman sitting across um, in, in this one room, so it was this kind of interesting setup. I told her the same thing about, I, I got rid of the properties that weren't in my neighborhood boundary. The young lady goes, oh no, well, you have to use those, that's just how we do it. And I said, no it isn't, I've already gone through this. And so, and then she would look up at the woman across from her and then look down and look up. And I had this feeling that she was brand spanking you and she was hoping not to say the wrong thing. But it was still, I, I, I couldn't say anything. Um, well, I suppose I could have, but it was exasperated, and I felt like I'd entered a dead zone, and and uh, and then this, uh, and finally I just said, okay, 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 and tried to go another round, but um, so, but that was also hostile, you know, with this person telling me no, and I'm, I'm saying yes because I've actually done this before. So, bottom line, how are people trained to? to be hostile in this situation. Um, I'm not, this is not a joke, really. I mean, are they trying to like, man, you know, don't back down, you know? I don't know, what can you say about the kind of really customer service that that we're getting or lack thereof? Um, I, I was, it makes me dread my next protest because it's so unpleasant. Well, I certainly don't have any interest. How long ago was your formal appeal? Um, two years ago. Okay. Should have been better. And your informal was last year. We have had some turnover. I mean, in the last 14 years, I've got less than a 1% attrition rate. Uh, but we have lost a lot of, I mean, the appraisal district's 36 years old. I've lost a lot of old hands that have been around a long time. Quite honestly, between 2004 and 2006, I fired 65 people for not being able to get with the program on a customer service basis. For every complaint I get like that, or not even a complaint, just an explanation of what you experienced. I mean, number one, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. uh, but I literally have probably a hundred handwritten uh, customer service surveys that we ask for every day uh, that the taxpayers take the time to fill out or they'll sit there and write me. Certainly not discounting what you've experienced, but here's the number one thing. I'm in the building. My two deputy chiefs are in the building. The residential manager is Tommy Allison. 
very personable young man. He's one of the three guys I think that can do this job when I retire. Very shortly, I hope. Um, you can only listen to so many appeals. Absolutely no one is trained to be hostile. The review board, I've heard, can be a hostile environment. We've done everything we can to try to get our staff to not be a part of that. But I have zero authority over the review board. I can't fire them for bad decisions. I can't increase their pay or decrease their pay or schedule them for work or not schedule them for work. But I'll get blamed for everything they do wrong and none of the credit for everything they do right. And that's okay. That's part of my job. Everybody that sues me will have to go to the board and be so inexplicably unhappy they sue me. That's okay. It's part of the job. If you have that bad experience, I don't want anyone being threatened in my office. Please ask to see Tommy. If Tommy can't or won't see you, please ask to see the chief appraiser. I've given my direct phone number out over the radio, over the television. I've given my direct email out. I'm not inundated with negative calls or harassing emails. So please, if you experience that, um, number one, as I say, I apologize. Number two, I doubt that's gonna happen to you. We do have probably eight relatively inexperienced people, and by that I mean they probably have less than three years experience. Um, nobody has a quota. Nobody has a minimum number that they can do for you. But if they exceed a number, for the protection of the district as well as your integrity and their integrity, we do require a manager to sign off on whatever they're doing. I don't care how long they've been there. That's just the bottom line. Doesn't matter if they're a tax agent represented, actually, especially if they're tax agent represented. I want to make sure there's no collusion whatsoever. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Explain the free some taxes. Um, I'm not sure if it's over 65 or 65 and over. What do I do? I'll be 65 next year. What do I do? How do I do that? And the deadline, if it's 65, well, April 30th. Most, most deadlines are going to be April 30th as far as your exemptions go. If you're over 65, I'll probably send you an invitation to apply. Uh, if you have a Texas driver's license. And I say that simply because they passed the law several years ago, so I'm supposed to track everybody's address in Bear County who's over 65 or whose DMV report says they're over 65 as of a certain date. You can qualify as of the date of your birthday. Okay? Yeah, you turn 65. Yes, ma'am. And so when you turn 65, again, you can go to www.bcad.org on our website download the form, make a copy of your driver's license, send it in. Or you can come to the office, we'll pre-print the form for you, you sign it, give us a copy of your driver's license, we'll redact all your data off of that driver's license. Uh, but we just need to verify that you are who you are, claiming the exemption that you're claiming. The over 65 is very, 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 very valuable to you in San Antonio, Texas. In no other major metropolitan taxing jurisdiction, city or county, in the state of Texas. Not Dallas, not Houston, not Austin, not Tarrant, not Fort Worth, not that. None of those places have what we have. In 19, um, don't make me not tell the truth, but I don't remember exactly what year. We passed the referendum, the 65 and over exemption and the disabled exemption, essentially the same thing, uh, provides protection for you to qualify for a freeze of your taxes as of the year that you qualify on your homestead. Doesn't apply to any other property. Now, it doesn't protect you from future value increases. It simply says, if you are not adding to the square footage of your home, if you're not adding a pool or a cabana or outside kitchen or making some other, other than normal maintenance uh, improvement to your home, your value can do whatever it wants. Your taxes are frozen. If like in 2008 and 9, we lower values and the combined tax rate and your new value ends up being less than your freeze amount, you always pay the lesser of the two. 
you can go back up as high as your freeze. Here's what's important. Let's say that you buy a scratch-off and you hit the lottery. I don't know. You decide you want to move to the Dominion. For whatever reason, you want to have a crazy expensive house. Whatever the relationship was between your frozen taxes and your market value taxes, let's say that you were paying $5,000 in taxes when you should have been paying $10,000 in taxes. You have a 50% relationship in what you are paying and what you should have been paying as a result of your exemption. When you move to that million dollar home on the hill, your taxes today would be around $30,000. But because of your 50% relationship on your old over 65 homestead, you port that or you transport it from one property to another, anywhere in the state of Texas, whatever the value is. So instead of paying $30,000, you'd be paying $15,000. Very, very important. Um, as I say, we track that, but if we miss you, you can still go back a whole other year from the year that you qualify or otherwise would have been qualified. But it's a very, very valuable uh, exemption. And what makes it so valuable in San Antonio, historically, that's always been now we have a $25,000 homestead exemption. The over 65 adds $10,000 to that, and then they freeze your school taxes. That's the way it is in most places in Texas. In San Antonio, Texas, we freeze your city, your county, your school district, and your community college district. The only thing that isn't frozen is the hospital district and the San Antonio River Authority. Those are a minutia of your total tax bill. You won't even notice it. So it's very, very valuable here in San Antonio. Highly recommend it. If you're married in Texas, if it's your spouse that's over 65 or he or she is not listed on your deed, you still qualify for it. Um, so just keep that in mind. You don't have to necessarily be listed on the deed as long as we have proof of your marriage uh, or you hold yourself out as being uh, husband and wife or whatever the case may be. Yes, ma'am. So he's 65 and I'll be there soon. So it does, is it still frozen from our own stead then? You need to make sure you have that on file with us, but yes, it will be. And, and you, just like your homestead, you get one over 65, one homestead per property, per couple. Yes, sir. Um, you know, the last few years, the appraisal kept going up. Do you see, I guess you don't have a crystal ball on what the future is going to be. Kind of do. Oh, okay. Could you let us know, like, the next couple of years, uh, how do they look? Is Not great, oh. unless you're going to sell. Uh, you what you said, I didn't hear what you said. I'll repeat the question. He asked, what do I think is going to happen in the next couple of years with values? Do I have a crystal ball? It's called the Texas A&M Real Estate Center. And they've been tracking sold property, properties available for sale, number of houses being built, number of lots being developed, number of people moving into major metropolitan areas. I don't, I'm sure some, maybe somebody from the councilman's office knows this. I seem to think it's 25,000 either a year or a month in San Antonio. It's a crazy number. I'm sorry? Right, so that's more online with maybe on a monthly basis. And so with that kind of demand, we're seeing an unprecedented number of apartments going up, and we're seeing an unprecedented number of increases in value for residential property simply because the supply is about a third of what it should be to be a market considered to be in balance. And so it's very much a seller's market. Buyers are not being forced, but buyers are paying a premium for property in virtually every price range. If you will, I hate, I'm really not a statistician person. I've got a lot of those guys that work for me. But when you look at the median level of sales in San Antonio ISD, which is generally not thought of as the richest school district in town, it had the highest percentage increase from last year to this year in the median level of sales price paid. That's not what the appraisal district did. That's what you and your neighbors did. 
all over SAISD. And so, consequently, some of the biggest increases are inside Loop 410, all the way around the center of the city. Not every one of them, but more than not. I don't know that I can necessarily honestly say that 80% get something, but I will tell you this. 80% of last year's appeals, which was around 95,000 protests, um, roughly 80% of the people that took the time to come in were taken care of by the staff. They either got something and left, got nothing, and withdrew their protest. For whatever reason, that protest went away. Um, going to the review board, there's a higher no-show rate. People get mad, they come to the hearing, the market continues to go up. Maybe that vacation in Cabo sounds better than coming to the appraisal district. I don't know. But the bottom line is, we have about a 50 to 55% no-show rate at the ARB. And so I'm paying people to sit there. Most of the time, they are swamped, which is what made make it seem less than friendly. I don't know the vast majority of the people on my ARB, but I can tell you that they come from the same communities that we do from all over San Antonio. They are all San Antonians. They are, I shouldn't say that, mostly seem like nice folks. Um, they deal not only with homeowners, but they deal with tax agents and tax attorneys who are hostile. And I think there's pro probably some reciprocity from my staff with tax attorneys and tax agents. And I don't encourage that either. I tell them that's above their pay grade. That's my problem. I'm the one being sued. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to ask, is there any reason why you haven't received any kind of response from the ARB or the Federal Bureau of Justice? The deadline is not mine. The deadline is a state mandate. hard and fast deadline. You have till May 31st, unless a weekend or a holiday conflicts with that, or 30 days from the day you receive your notice, whichever is later. That's not a policy, that's a law. And so the answer is no. And, and that's set by the state? It is set by the state. All the language on your notice, and I know it's very convoluted, um, is promulgated in section 2609B of the tax code. It literally tells me what size font, what can be italics, what won't be italics, and even the fact that my name has to appear on the bottom of the notice. Trust me, that's not my choice. Anybody else? Yes, sir. So what I gather is the majority of the complaints, thank you for being here. Yes, thank you. The majority of the complaints you go to a state elected official, not so much a county or state. You know, my suggestion to the councilman, and I've done this in almost every council district, any, and I'll do it in any council district that asks me to come, because I belong to two statewide legislative associations. Any 10 of you people at a Ways and Means hearing arguing about a property tax bill will be a thousand times more successful than I will be as a bureaucrat. That's all I am to the state legislature. I'm a pain in their backside because I can tell you the truth, just like I tell them, they don't like it, maybe you don't like it. But the fact of the matter is, I've been doing this for 36 years, I knew when this process worked, and I believe it was maybe a little bit steeper hill to climb, generally for the taxpayer, but overall it was a lot fairer to homeowners because it wasn't such a scam where corporate taxpayers can avoid property taxes. And every tax that gets exempted, and every tax that gets avoided through whatever loophole, comes back to you. Unless you're frozen, unless you're a 100% disabled veteran, uh, you know. I think that it's best to work from the ground up. Uh, work through your council, work through your commissioner's court. Uh, Chico Rodriguez serves on my board as well. Um, all these guys are busy with elections and all that kind of stuff. And 
I don't know how y'all feel about term limits, and I don't even care. But I, I would just wish we could keep people in the office long enough for them to know where the bathroom is by themselves. Uh, you finally get them to understand something, and it's time for them to go. I'm not being an advocate for being a 40-year congressman, but good Lord, we just have very restrictive policies. It's hard to get smart about everything. Yes, sir. How's it going to the microphone there? <coughs> Um, I've gone down for almost 15 out of 20 years that I've lived in Monta Vista. Um, <clears throat> one issue that I have, and I don't know if it's like a, <coughs> a thought process with your people there, but when I go, I'll tell them who I am and you know where I live. They'll say, oh, you live in that neighborhood. Well, you know, there are some very beautiful homes in Monta Vista. There's some regular homes. <laughs> but y'all went up 50% of my property. On the land value? Yeah, the land, the actual land value. Okay, I know it's hard to depreciate land. I don't even know that you can do it. But does your company, your people, take into consideration that, like, my property is just one a half a block over from the intersection of the other brand? No. Okay, and that's a busy intersection. Okay, I've got a gas station there. I've got Taco Taco there. I have a speedway here. And I'm glad I'm not Anyway, they will say, well, you know, a house on Gramercy or Hillcrest over there, on the down, that's all over there. I am right on the Indy 500 here, you know, I have issues even with uh, the pharmacy. Uh, you know, if I go in the morning, I hear people coming out, I'm right there on that intersection. And it, it never hits them because it's like, we have a few of them on this end. And I would say, well, you know what? Right across the street, like these people down in the bottom, right across the street, you need to touch their boundaries. And they said, well, that, that's not my business. You're in my business. Okay, if I went to my business, what extra services am I getting? Am I getting extra trash pickup? Am I getting beautiful gold in the streets? I mean, what's what's the deal? If I go right across the street and see no increase whatsoever, but they come up 50% of mine. I don't think that. I have it the whole, the whole time that I've lived here in my business for 20 years. So if you can explain to me that I'm going to go there and protest. And I'm going to hit them on that 50% increase on the property because this, to me, it doesn't make any sense. And he lives, or he lives on the other brand too. I mean, you know, we both are on there, on that speedway. It's rough. Can I make a suggestion to you? Sure. Um, if you're an out first, and this will be year 16, I think Mark, I said, and this will be year 16 that you want to yeah. them now. Hmm. And we'll figure out what they come up with. And here's what I'm going to suggest. I live off of Huebner, and the posted speed limit is 45 miles an hour. If I was a cop, I would sit at the entrance to my gated community and get my quota any afternoon or any morning during rush hour. I mean, until it backs up from 1604 to the entrance to my subdivision, which is sometimes a 20 minute wait waiting to get in the gate. It is just that, it is a speed limit. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Up and down Huebner, we have another kind of strange thing. We have walls, and uh, people like to run into walls. <laughs> if I had children, I would not have a home that backs up to Huebner. My children are all grown. But I suggested that they might have a look at trying to find just sales that back up to Huebner and make both sides of those roads their own little neighborhood. I might suggest that you suggest that to them. It won't be the first time they've heard that, not specifically about Monta Vista, but I'm very familiar with the intersection of uh, McCullough and, and that whole area. I go to gyms there quite a lot, and I like lunch, I have breakfast for lunch, and I don't miss many meals, as you can tell. Um, but I certainly would engage them in that conversation because it won't be the first time they've heard it. Uh, I try not to dictate the appraisal practice and try to talk to them more theoretically. Uh, I make that suggestion to you in all earnest because it won't be the first time they've heard that kind of reason. Uh, and I hope they realize that people do, that, do live in a historic neighborhood. It's rough because you're buying stuff that you can't go down here to home people. You know, you're dealing with plumbers and plumbing that's 80 years old. I know. You're trying to find retrofit. <coughs> so there's a lot of extra costs. 
sure. You have a historic district have to deal with. And of course, you have to go through the review board to make any changes. So you're right. constantly you're jumping hoops. So what else they can do? Try what I suggest. It's hard to engage them in conversation. And I don't know whether it's been formal or informal. Maybe it's always been the formal hearing that I've gone to. I don't use an attorney. I try to represent myself. It's my property. Mm -hmm. But I'm told you get to speak first, then we'll speak. You won't get to speak after we're done speaking. That's Very the, hostile. That's the review board. Yeah. Very hostile. Can't do I'm just thinking. It's just that's not the way to have a conversation. When I was talking about was suggesting to him that he enlighten them a little bit. Well, he better do his enlightening while he has his opportunity. To speak. I was actually talking about my staff at the end of And what I was going to suggest beyond that was if the staff appraiser is not receptive, perhaps you might engage one of the supervisors. And that would, I believe this slide is that. Yes, ma'am. I have several questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'd like to know, I mean, the meeting is being recorded. I'd like to know if I can have a comment. Uh, it's not my, no, sure. I can, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Is, it, is your office on Martin and Frio? Martin and Frio, 411 North Frio. Um, if a property is owned by several um, siblings, um, and the tax statement was always sent um, to one, one of the siblings and at them, Okay, and then all of a sudden it changes. What would make um make it take, make it change to each individual? What would cost that? Usually, the either the filing of some sort of document or a written request by whoever was the last listed, whoever the first person on the call is on the last deed. Okay, um, how am I able to find out who? If you'll contact. Um, There you go. Uh, Join the graph. Yeah. Uh, if you'll contact Roy Sandoval, he's in charge of the mapping and the GIS department. He's one of my assistant chiefs. GIS and he'll get you in, yes, and he'll get you in touch with, uh, you can reach him directly at 210-242-2413. Go ahead, Tim, go ahead. 210 242 2413. 2413? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, another question is, um, let's say, um, let's say that, uh, we have a residential property and it has, um, one, two or three other buildings. Mm -hmm. Um, does the, uh, Appraisal district have a right to call call you and ask you what you're doing with the other buildings? We have a responsibility to list and discover every single taxable piece of property in Bear County. Um, I don't know, are they business type property? No. Are they? Residential. Okay. Then they're just trying to find out if it's residential or if it's actually finished out. If it has never happened before, what? would cost that we, for them to call. Somebody, somebody saw it, most likely. Um, I see residential properties in the neighborhood, in the 7207 <coughs> District 1. Yes, and uh, those properties have a lot of illegal immigrants and a lot of uh, poor people that rent out homes. There, there can be a family in in one room, sure. they might have five rooms, and uh, every room is, is uh, rented out to different families. Now, what are we all doing to look into that compared to a person that owns property? And you all come and want to find out what are you all doing with that property? I, I mean, I'm, I'm upset. I'm, I'm angry. Not, I'm not sure how the question was posed or why the question They was called. They called. Were there building permits on the property? No. I don't know anyone that diligent in my office, to be honest. <laughs> uh, usually it requires either a taxpayer asking us to come out there and inspect the property or yeah, some sort of building permit. There may have been a building permit on an adjoining property that they saw 
because typically when they go out, they go out with a uh, confluence of properties in a certain area, and they may notice that, okay, there's some improvements on this property that we don't have listed. In the 36 years, I can't think of one time I've heard this, but, you know, I'm sure it happened. There, there's no concerted effort other than the law requires us and requires me to sign a document before we turn the records over to the appraisal review board for the hearings to start for me to swear or affirm that I have caused or major be caused the listing and discovering of all taxable property in, in our jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. To the extent that we do that, I've never heard of anyone doing what you just described, which is not discounting that it happened. I'm just saying I've never heard of it. Mm -hmm. What are you all going to do with the uh, illegal immigrants that live like that or that purchase a property in several different types of families? Man, I don't have the authority to do anything with illegal immigrants. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, if I'm on your property and you tell me to get off, I have to get off your property. That's the law. No, what I'm saying is them renting out rooms to families I don't and, have to. and, and basically <coughs> just. I mean, you're not reporting all of that. If you are legal or illegal and you own property in Bear County, the chief appraiser has absolutely zero authority to tell you what you can or cannot do with your property. That's up to the city. And yet they came and called me and asked me. Ma'am, I've already addressed yeah, that. I, I, I don't know not how like, or why that It sounds happened. more like folks that somebody made a complaint to Coke. Well, I'd like to find out. Sure. I'd like to get to the bottom of it. If you'll ask Roy, he can look into that for you as well. Okay. And I'll be happy to talk to him about that. Okay. And it was, I don't know who was first, so. Oh, I, I just had a quick question. Trains go by our house. Trains go by our house a hundred times a day. Can we use noise to get around that rule? Yes. Yeah. 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 You can sue me for anything or nothing at all. <laughs> Most of the people that live where the noise is are living there either because they want it to be where the noise is, they like the downtown location, or it doesn't bother them. What we would do then is take that argument, look at the sales that have occurred in the relevant time frame, hopefully in close enough proximity to have also been either positively or negatively impacted by whatever influences you think exist. And we would attempt to try to help you prove or disprove that. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I just bought a house in Lubbocka. And I'm feeling really stupid now. <laughs> uh, I'm freaking out, actually. Um, I've got two questions. Okay, I don't get uh, a tax statement until October. So I don't know what my taxes are going to be. How can I find out so I can prepare? You know. I'll tell you what I can. Do. Okay. Because nobody gets their tax until October, sometimes okay. November. Okay. But I always take uh, whatever the value is on my own, whatever I just paid for, because you have the best evidence. Right. The most recent sale price. Um, take last year's taxes and add whatever makes you comfortable. Maybe three percent. Okay, but it's, it's a new house. Okay, so taxes oh, from last oh, year oh, were like nothing. What was the total? Well, you don't have to tell me. Yeah. Use your purchase price of the land okay. and your purchase price of the new improvements. And I would use, uh, I think your combined tax rate was about 269 last year. Maybe use 275. I don't think that's going to happen, particularly since the legislature beat on local jurisdiction so much this year about not lowering the rates in that, which I happen to think they're right, because it can't be long, uh, but I don't think it's not. But that's how I do it. And you know, uh, probably, uh, is a home mortgage? No. Okay, so you pay cash. Um, gosh, my wife takes care of all these things, and she always has a budget. <laughs> Uh, just like you had a budget when you built the house, right. you know, you weren't going to spend over this much mm -hmm. over the land cost or whatever your total project was, I would simply go back and add, uh, there's no way that rate's going to be over five cents over last year. I just don't believe that. Okay. In, a, in a climate like we have right now where the legislature's still in session, 
uh, possibility for a, a special session that's much impact as has been shown to local jurisdictions, wrong-headedly or not. Uh, mm -hmm. They still were the object of a lot of disaffection, if you will. Uh, so I would use that. And, uh, you know, if you want, um, that, that's just the best thing to do. Use the total purchase price of your property. Uh, divide by 100, multiply times the tax rate. Okay, what's the tax rate I think it was 269 last year. I'm suggesting you use something higher than that, combined okay. maybe 275. Okay. Um, and that should give you enough to cushion. One other thing you might also know if your home is paid off, the county has, I'm told, uh, a payment plan where you can set up 10 equal installments and they'll treat it like a mortgage for you. And they'll take in money from you every month so you don't have to write it. $5,000 check at the end of the year or $10,000 check or whatever the case may be. And I, I don't know if that's available to anybody other than homeowners, <coughs> but I think if it's your home, they certainly will do that for you. Okay, and as far as filing the homestead exemption, when do I do that? When did you move in? About three weeks ago. Okay, so anytime between now and January 1 of next year, you'll be able to. Okay. So, we'll so, probably send you a date. Give you one to close Usually, the title company will do that. Okay. You can download that form off of www.bcap.org. Okay. Uh, fill it out, make yourself a copy, uh, send it into a copy of the driver's license, and you should get a date before, before so you get started. Okay. okay, and then, okay, I had heard that Greg Abbott had said that the homeowners, um, I mean, the, um, sorry, the tax was like unconstitutional. Did anybody else hear that? And that he was going to do something about that? He's a liar. He's a liar. <laughs> <laughs> and you can not In you church. Sit down, in sit church. Sit down and listen to what he said. I mean, what, what he said, said is not going to affect the homeowners at all because the state of Texas doesn't assess a property tax. The county does. If you look, even though our property taxes are very high, if you look at the total incidence of taxation in Texas, because we don't have a state income tax, if you look at the total incidences of taxes, we're about 44th or 45th in the nation because we don't have an income tax. Uh, how do we change that? I mean, like you're talking about the the city. City. How, I mean, can we can we together and I, I love the way you say sue me. I think that's pretty cool that you said that. <laughs> because it's like, you really want us to, right? Yeah. Well, remember earlier whenever you said go ahead and sue me? Yeah. Do you really want us to do that? <laughs> really? No. Well, come to the meeting. That's good. Thank you very much. I have a quick, a really quick nitpicky question just, just to understand the details. Sure. Um, you said that uh, the property taxes are assessed by neighborhood, but at some point, and I may have misunderstood, it could be by school district. So what is, because there was a gentleman asking, is it one mile, is it five miles, is it 20 miles? Celia, my neighbor, I'm also on the um, she was saying that across the train tracks, it was appraised differently. So where we are, we're in Lavaca, but we're not in the same school district. I don't feed into Bonham, I feed into Green. So I wasn't sure, are we assessing my school district? Are we assessing my named neighborhood? Is it by what kind of district zones have? I know this is going to sound like I'm lying to you. I promise you I'm not. For school funding purposes, the state looks at it in a macro view by school district. Appraisal districts are required to look down to the neighborhood level. That neighborhood may change from one end of Hildebrand to another or one end of North St. Mary's to another, or one end of Alamo to another. Uh, you know, it just happens. Sometimes it's a man-made change, like a highway or a railroad or a waterway or a golf course or a, or a, or a, or a. Uh, those things can affect why people are paying what they're paying to live in a certain part of Lavaca or whatever other neighborhood. Uh, but we will do the best to show you the overlays of what we consider to be the neighborhood boundaries. And that's not something that changes very readily. That's something that we try to adhere to based on market evidence. 
And if we've made a mistake, that's something that can be changed. It's something that can be challenged. Not in terms of a value or a lawsuit, but I'd like to think at the end of the day, cooler heads could prevail. And if you don't get the answer, um, I've always been taught to go up to the next level. And I've already told you my door is open, so I'm amenable to looking at whatever you think the neighborhood ought to be and whatever my staff says the neighborhood ought to be. Okay, but for now we're being assessed by named the borders as we understand the named neighborhood to be La Barca, King William, Monte Vista. Absolutely. Okay. Thank Absolutely. You. I think we have about 1,400 of those. And if this, we've got about 15 minutes, and I want to be respectful of the pastor's time. Yes. So if we could take another maybe two really? or so questions. And if you don't get your question answered, I'll meet you in the parking lot. <laughs> yes, sir. The sales data. Yes, sir. Where are you getting that? I'll be honest with you. Uh, bank borrow, the appeal process. We used to be members of MLS. Uh, MLS kicked me out. Four years ago? Wow. Yes. There is, Texas is one of 11 states in the nation that is a non-disclosure state, meaning as a taxpayer, you have a right to privacy about whatever you paid or didn't pay for your property. The National Association of Realtors sent a letter to the Texas Association of Realtors who subsequently <coughs> sent a letter to all their boards of realtors and said, you are hereby prohibited from giving out MLS data, which is copyrighted data, to any taxing authority, darn sure including an appraisal district. We do have realtors who don't necessarily abide by all of your own rules. Okay. And, and quite honestly, I have realtors that have worked in my office. Okay. Next question. Yes, ma'am, way in the back. Do you have the ability of... Um, Thank you. you come, I just, I, my hearing is so bad. Do I have the ability to remove photos on the online protest? Yes. You do? Okay. Yes. We can accept that digitally and we can share information with you electronically as well, and you can yay or nay it. And if you decide to do an online appeal and you're not satisfied with whatever we're offering you, your next step is, as if you had an informal, you just go straight to the review board and you can make your case there. We're still limited to whatever we gave you. That is true. Um, it works better because the state requires us to keep evidence of whatever you introduce to the review board. And that is a separate entity. Even though they're in my office and paid out of my budget, I can't hire them, I can't fire them, I can't do anything to them. I'm sorry, I think this gentleman is next. Can we include crime statistics, uh, street improvements or not improvements? Uh, Let me just suggest to you that you can include anything that makes you happy. But the fact of the matter is, those same statistics should apply to whoever the buyers and sellers are in your neighborhood on your street. And so, to that end, I would like to think that that is already reflected in the prices being paid by properties. Yeah, big issue in King William and Lavaque is the pilot parking pilot program. Yes, I know. I'm quite familiar. I tend to eat mostly at Liberty Bar because they have their own parking lot. Uh -huh. yes, sir, you I was going to ask a little bit. Flesh out some more of the homestead exemption. Yes. Um, it was my understanding what you said a minute ago that the lady that just bought a house filed January 1 right. and then she would get the homestead exemption for 18. Is that correct? Right. You have to be, it has to be your principal place of residence that you occupy on January 1 of the first tax year that you owned it. So if you bought a house and you just moved in three weeks ago, you wouldn't be eligible for this year, but you would be eligible for next year. Something else, if your house burns down on January 2nd, you owe taxes for the whole year. If you break ground on your home on January 2nd and you don't finish it until April, it's not taxable until January 1 of the next year. A lot of this is not the improvements. Also state law, not our policy. I think that's all we have time for. 
I am going to walk outside. If you have any individual questions, I'll be glad to talk to you. I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of District 1 and the Councilman for you all coming out this evening. We hope you found it to be uh, enlightening and informative. We very much appreciate the partnership uh, from Michael and Mesquita to come here and have this conversation with you. Uh, I know someone asked about the Nowcast broadcast. It should be online, nowcastsa.com, tomorrow late afternoon. So you can, you can revisit that. Uh, so again, thank you. And then we, we do have a Neighborhood Association president who's actually going to have Mr. Amesquita out tomorrow, uh, about a half a mile from here at the Kenwood Senior Center. Uh, Betty Eckert, almost correct, Harris will be meeting 6.30 tomorrow. 6 o'clock. So if anyone wants uh, a slight redo uh, and, and maybe an opportunity to ask a, another question or two, there's yet another opportunity to do so. And our office always wants to be engaged to help answer any of your questions.